that I'm very proud of right now is our Leaning in a Crisis Summit. It's going, it's going to go through June every Wednesday and Thursday. We're adding new talks all the time. Don't hesitate to, to reach out if there's a talk or an expert you'd like to, to hear more from. And you can check out our new leaders. And, and thank you for telling your friends at Leading in crisis.turnkeycoachingsolutions.com. You can see it across the, the top there. So now I'm very excited to introduce our expert. Svetlana Elfimova is the co-founder of We Will Consulting and serves as the head of organizational development at Red Square International in London. Um, she serves uh, also uh, personal clients as a career coach who are for clients who are going through a career transition. Um, she coaches individuals with building business strategies, uh, it, it moving from individual careers to business ownership. Um, she also really is passionate about preventing burnout and lowering stress. And as such, she has co-founded We Will Consulting. So um, one more thing I want to mention, though, is she actually serves right now as the head of OD for RSI. And as such, uh, Svetlana, you're going to share with us some of the strategies and things you've been doing at RSI to just navigate this COVID-19 crisis and how you've managed to um, it enable your organization to be successful through this. So what did I miss? What are we going to learn today? And, and tell us a little bit about you and, and take it away. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you very much for um, uh, inviting me today. I'm, I'm honored to be one of the speakers. Um, yeah, so uh, basically when the pandemic started, uh, we shifted very quickly back um, to the home office, uh, if I would say. And one of the main things that I have focused is talking to employees and really listening to their concerns and supporting them on this way. It wasn't an easy journey. Of course, there were like a lot of fluctuation, a lot of uncertainty and anxiety um, related to the situation. But we managed to really um, pick up the business even because we recently started to uh, enter a new market and we refocused on that market, which is IT recruitment. And that significantly helped us to go through this period of pandemic, which is not over yet, but we are discussing now who and when will be ready to go back to the office. And we uh, keep this uh, option open for people to choose whether they want to go back uh, in the middle of June or they prefer to stay home. And safety and communication is the main things that um, we currently focusing on. Okay. Uh, than, uh, yeah, so I'll speak today uh, about navigating the re-entry challenge from the perspective of a business psychologist. First of all, we'll share some theory behind the stress theories and uh, stress reactions and what's actually going on with uh, us physiological, uh, emotional uh, level. So in the next 30 minutes, I'll, I'll talk a bit of uh, theory and then share to the practical advice how we can plan re-entry and uh, plan this journey back to the office. Excellent. So we'll begin by discussing why going back to uh, so-called normality makes people uh, distress and anxiety. Even though we are looking back, uh, looking forward to going back, uh, we developed a baggage of emotions associated with uncertainty and global health crisis, obviously. Uh, not only we may uh, fear physical uh, risk and threat to our health due to the virus, but we're also concerned about uh, job security, financial stability, worry for security significant others. And that's exactly what our employees are experiencing. One of the first questions my uh, one of my colleagues asked, like, Svetlana, how am I going to help my grandma? You know, like if we don't, we, if we get out of the business. And that's the sort of situation we all had to manage. Um, anxiety about going back to normal is called uh, reverse culture shock. 
after a long time being isolated. Um, and then when we have to return, we may have a lot of difficulties make choices and have lack of concentration, have mood fluctuations and so on, which are very similar to stress reactions. And uh, this is a struggle to reintegrate. And the main thing here, we'll have to develop that new uh, experience and shared experience all over again together after such a long time of isolation. Uh, so people and employees, uh, everyone, I would say, um, may feel confused, worried, and apprehensive about going back. And that's kind of an obvious thing. But the sense of of outside world, um, maybe you have experienced that if you stay indoors for a while and then go for a walk, it's a little bit awkward and there are quite a lot of tension built up in the body. So all that sensory stimulation, uh, as well as commuting, for example, to work and uh, physical and uh, mental demand on work may uh, cause us uh, distress and therefore we're more prompt for mistakes uh, or even work-related injuries uh, and future absence. So uh, what we recommend um, like in the workside community to do is to, how, uh, to allow people ease themselves into this uh, returning back uh, and getting back to the full workload. Sorry, <laughs> we're talking about stress and that's exactly what I can experience, you know, when all these signs come up. So another main, uh, one of the main points that I want to make is that every single person in the world has experienced something very different, yet still similar, but very different. We cannot judge how others may have been affected by the circumstances based on how we felt. And to be honest, I fell into that trap myself because I'm, I'm being dealing pretty well with the lockdown and the pandemic situation because of different reasons like personality traits uh, might be not predisposition for stress exposure or overreaction. Context and the life that I have uh, might be uh, also supporting um, my reaction as well as person environment interaction, how person reacts uh, uh, on the stress or also different for everyone. So it's been very different for everyone. And that's why um, we should be very sensitive when we talk about the pandemic. For instance, some of us may have skills to better manage stress than others. Some have a supportive environment, as I said before. Uh, for example, neuroticism, when we're talking about personality, which is being related to your emotions, being sensitive to your emotions, having a kind of closer connection to your emotions and recognizing them. That really, uh, this um, trait, neuroticism, if it's uh, on a high um, level, uh, that may um, predisposition people to extremely I uh, feel extremely uh, the stress reactions. Will you uh, mention that again? You're, if it's based on if what's based on a high level? Neuroticism, if um, personality trait neuroticism is quite high, and then we are feeling that a lot more, and we uh, I act in a way that we kind of expose ourselves to stressful events and information. For example, people who have high level of neuroticism, they may stick to their phones checking news all the time and the numbers associated with the uh, crisis, uh, health crisis and, and so on. And those who are into conscientiousness, for example, they would just plan and uh, create the routine and uh, plan for how they can prevent uh, spread of disease and uh, emotional well-being and like the better uh, support. Okay. So basically the, the science and the psychology that you're talking about, we can actually un, uh, a little better understand how different employees and different co-workers or peers or family members manage the stress of this. And, and that's kind of the key point is to understand we just aren't going to manage it all the same. 
Yeah, exactly. And understanding that difference in people uh, make the management a bit more compassionate, I would say, and the leading people who are different, understanding their different needs is quite important. Also, another crucial point that I would like to uh, talk about is that a majority of employees will be returning to the of mental health due to the challenges faced. And However, psychological well-being is the only significant uh, predictor of performance. And that's how well-being and psychological well-being is related to performance. And that's why it's quite important to uh, think through how we're going to help people um, go through this change uh, in a better way. And uh, on the other hand, it is important to regulate our own expectations. At this moment, um, your audio is going in and out. Um, try it. Try saying what you just said again. I think you might have just. There you go. Say it again. Um, Paige is uh, on, and she said that she's having a hard time hearing as well. So repeat that last sentence that you had, and we'll see if your audio is better. If not, do you have a cell phone that you can use to call in if necessary? Mm. Um, yeah, so now we can't hear you at all. Um, it, in the lower left-hand corner, there is the little speaker and you can switch to call in, switch to phone audio, and it'll give you the phone number to dial. So folks that are listening, thank you for your patience. And um, while Svetlana is um, calling in, you have that phone number? Ah, yes, okay, I see she's connecting to audio. Uh, the technology is gonna catch up here shortly. Uh, we still cannot hear you, um, but it does say connecting to audio. All right, Can talk you hear me now? Um, I'm really sorry. It sounds like, yeah. Okay. Cool. That's my um, saving point. Um, we can continue. Okay. Very serious. Something as well. I'm stop your video on your phone, but keep the audio. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. Okay. So. <laughs> Uh, one of the main points that I was talking about is psychological well-being um, is uh, one of the significant predictors of the performance. And uh, we should regulate our expectations for the early stages of the re-entry process because the performance is not going to be the same. Can you hear me okay? Yes, so much better. That's great. Okay, okay. Um, okay, so we will um, talk about it in, in a rather systematic approach a bit later. Okay, let's talk, uh, take a look into the physiology of stress in relation to COVID-19 and how it influences our behavior in the workplace. Uh, stress affects the internal regulatory systems um, and processes are responsible for homeostasis or balance. So basically, when we have a stress reaction, it activates autonomic nervous system and it shuts quite a few uh, very important uh, body uh, systems such as uh, reproductive, digestive, and uh, immune system is being also compromised when we have a physiological um, reaction to stress. That's why uh, people may have difficulties with uh, digestion and so on um, after a prolonged uh, time of being uh, in a stressful situation. Uh, stress is a major uh, cause of sickness absence in the workplace and it costs about over over five billion of, um, pounds a year in the Great Britain. Also, it, of course, um, associated causes with the replacement of staff, uh, lost production and increased accidents. So when there's a threat outside, basically, and just in simple words, yes, there's a threat outside or inside, um, unexpected event or unpredictable situation happens uh, uh, with us uh, the same way what, like we all have experienced now with the pandemic. It's all associated with a poor sense of control. And that's exactly uh, um, what, what's going on. And there are two types of stress, acute stress and 
chronic and uh, you must uh, must be familiar familiar with them acute is the short one uh, chronic is the long-term uh, stress and that's what we are uh, experiencing or maybe uh, um, maybe experiencing and the risk about the chronic one is not only health risks uh, mental and uh, physical health has been uh, challenged but also uh, it's increased risk of burnout now during the pandemic and that's not i don't see a lot of people talking about that at the moment but a burnout is not uh, tiredness it's just not being uh, tired but it's a total exhaustion on all levels emotional uh, physical and uh, cognitive levels and uh, um, burnout is quite contagious in the office if they're not addressed, if not treated on time. So uh, we may recognize well um, the signs of stress in ourselves. Yes, when we have the body uh, behaving differently, you know, increased heart rate, uh, we start to breathe uh, in a shallow way, rapid way. Uh, we have elevated blood pressure. If to measure that, uh, we may have dizziness or headaches, muscle tension, and so on. It's a kind of easier, familiar to recognize those in ourselves, but a bit more difficult when we are um, working with people and to recognize those signs in someone else. Um, so uh, the next slide, please, Dan. You know, on this one right here, I think that, um, yeah, would you go back one, just one? I, mm -hmm. I really want to say thank you for, for bringing this out. I think a lot of times in business, we talk about stress in theory. We understand that there's research studies that show it costs us a lot of money. We understand it in theory. <laughs> But there's not necessarily a connection to understanding it, at least in common knowledge around this isn't theory. This isn't HR saying, oh, we've got to just be gentle with our people and make sure they don't know there's there's a physical illness that happens with too much stress. And and so all of this put together, you're making the case for really making sure that there's wellness programs at work and that we're exactly. helping our employees manage stress and that we're observing that just because I may handle stress differently, that should mm. not be the barometer by which I, ha I expect others. Exactly. Yeah. And um, because activation of our autonomic nervous system happens and on physiological level a lot of other functions they shut that's why it's dangerous to be in that state for a long time and that's how it's connect connected because sometimes you know um, still when I speak with uh, business owners and HR uh, managers and just you know like in place as well like well-being is associated with something okay feeling good about myself about life but actually there are a lot more into that and it's about uh, financial uh, well-being as well as uh, social well-being and sense of belonging sense of community with others so it's interconnected but also of course uh, at the moment a lot of us uh, have every single person probably been um, having a stress reaction to that and that's why we should remain physically active that's why when our body um, really contracts the muscles we need to learn how to relax how to detach psychologically from work and switch uh, into home mode so these are the signs on the uh, screen that you can see um, of others like uh, how you can recognize stress in other people and what might be going on so if you see someone having mood fluctuations uh, injuries or complaining about uh, chest pain or headaches that might be all related to that uh, fact uh, let's do the next slide so what's going on with us yes we have gone through this major change in life whether it's change of circumstances or had to move back to another city home city or we've uh, lost something or even lost some um, dear ones and that may happen as well when we manage people and um, yeah and it takes us on an emotional journey and people um, 
employee returning back to work will also require a bit more time and support and psychological safety created in the office for them to go through the stages and uh, come to that point where they're ready to um, deal with their problems and actually uh, get back to their uh, high level of pers uh, performance. So we've spoken about burnout quickly already, but um, important to, um, for example, there was a study uh, with, on a medical group of people, I think nurses, it was pre, um, pre-pandemic um, study, quite a large one. And they recognize when uh, nurses are being uh, totally involved and have this large input into their work and don't have enough time or energy to recover. And they may start to uh, be cynical about other people. They may feel uh, less uh, personal about like depersonalization is happening. So really creating this uh, bond between me and uh, the other person who is in need of my help that I provide through work. And that distancing uh, is actually a coping mechanism so that after a bit of time, after this uh, time for myself, I'll be returning with the new energy and time and help more people to deal with their situation through my work, like whether it's uh, medical, uh, in medical circumstances or any uh, uh, sort of work when we work with people when we are on the age of burnout we really start to uh, disconnect and quit social uh, circles and activities and uh, however important to understand here that people may still perform very well uh, especially if you're in call centers, people may still perform and meet their KPIs by being on the edge of burnout. That's why it's uh, very important for line managers to kind of raise awareness of how to recognize and prevent burnout and help others to also know there's a such phenomena because it takes a very long time to go back to normal. Yeah. Mm. All the psychologists talk about um, a lack of recovery um, because we kind of develop these ideas of um, as if I will work uh, a year, let's say, or six months and then take a longer um, break. However, it's recommended and the studies confirmed to uh, focus on recovery in the evenings and uh, during the weekend and take longer weekends, for example, more often rather than uh, taking a long holiday. And that helps to recover on the go and prevent the burnout. Let's go to the next slide. So what's happening uh, uh, in the companies because of the uh, uh, challenged uh, psychological well-being and mental health, um, obviously you have uh, came across, I believe, uh, sick leave, uh, turnover, high turnover, absenteeism and presenteeism. Usually presenteeism costs a lot more to organizations uh, than absenteeism. And presenteeism is when people can't deliver um, on the same level as they would be doing it. Yeah, so that's a bit of uh, numbers around mental health and what's, uh, what's happening. For example, 48% days of sick due to mental health issues uh, is what's going on. Um, 792 million people affected by mental health uh, issues worldwide. And one in six of adults may have a mental health issue that are, they are also not aware. That's why it's recommended to run uh, assessments and maybe well-being questionnaires to kind of help people to navigate uh, through this time. And, okay, uh, so how do we address it? We are shifting to the uh, practical part of my talk. Um, Yes, yeah, so through situational engineering and uh, trainings. So you have spoken quite a lot of, uh, about um, when you presented your company and what you do and what we see uh, in terms of how people adapt into um, the re-entry and how they are planning and strategizing a return back to the office. 
And so that's called situational, uh, situational engineering. So these are some of the examples what can be done, um, promoting the healthy work conditions and practices, awareness training, such as burnout awareness training, stress uh, management training, and so on, uh, as well as coaching focused on prevention of burnout or employee performance. So these are some that are uh, quite popular approaches, but we're going to shift into the next one and and pay a bit more attention. So um, my invo uh, kind of my approach today is to uh, think about these three major uh, areas: environment, physical environment in the office, communication, and performance. That's uh, before we start planning. Uh, this is what I would like to um, us pay attention to. Okay, so we learned about uh, how stress affects us on an individual team and organizational level. And in this uh, final section, we'll talk about uh, navigation strategies to cover these three areas. And so in terms of the environment and hygiene, uh, when yeah, so one of the uh, things that I already have covered at the very beginning is listen to your employees. I uh, have these surveys, uh, regular uh, well-being check-ins and so on. Uh, have a time to speak to your people and maybe they will suggest a way that will be su uh, suitable for them in terms of uh, returning back. A psychologically uh, safe place is uh, co-created together with your employees. So first of all, um, before implementing this return, speak to your employees, as I said already, agree on those workplace adjustments with them using the surveys, and that will increase their compliance and adherence, and that will actually um, be shared ownership when you come up with the new norms for the office, and the people will be on board. Uh, follow uh, medical advice by the government. That's the next step. Did you want to say something, Nisa? Well, I think you're probably going to cover it in, in here shortly. So I'm going to hold my question. <laughs> so keep going. Yeah. Yeah, so the next step after you have spoken with uh, your employees through the surveys, feedback sessions, uh, questionnaires, and so on, and got some information, maybe uh, some people like team leaders and so on could be very helpful in that process. Uh, full medical um, advice by the government or um, trusted uh, resources. And when organizing the physical environment and hygiene measures, um, we should plan for free distribution of personal protective equipment such as masks and antibacterial uh, gels and everybody speaks about that. But the main thing here is to encourage to develop this new behavior. Uh, when the gel is, is just basically on your desk, it's a lot easier to use it and develop this new behavior rather than um, just having a, a let's say a gel at the entrance um, only. So I have a yeah, quick so, question about this. Yeah. So this is not necessarily linearly for or, or yeah. is it, right? Because you know a lot of us will, you know, we're gonna start work tomorrow, right? So all of the policies have to be pre-organized and the communication yeah. has to be strategized and planned. But you are saying as far as Whatever you have as an organization, you, you push it out there, you communicate, but you're also opening it up for two-way dialogue, to listening as much as communicating. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, I believe, yeah, if we did have probably a bit more time for that, but it, it's, um, you don't have to implement everything, but choose those simple steps for the company that will work for your company and for your people. And another thing that is quite important here to have this walk through with your employees online before they physically come to the office. That's so great. they are aware they are aware of these new norms and how we're going to behave uh, in these new circumstances. Also, uh, it will lower the level of anxiety people have because they know it's going to be different and it's not going to be the normal how it used to be before the pandemic. And we will have to have this uh, distance, physical distance. So, um, yeah, I think this is uh, pretty visual um, on, on the screen. So redesigning desks and common areas so that uh, people are a little bit away from each other. 
Um, also, it's important to uh, properly organize uh, return to the office in a staggered way and so that we manage the entrance and exit and avoid crowding uh, uh, on the public transport and uh, the entrance. So we, uh, we should probably organize security, um, maybe have an extra help of the security in the entrance of the building. Um, so the people, uh, if you have the uh, keep, uh, passcode keypads that we all have to touch, many, many people, hundreds of people touching that. So probably there's a, a different, better and safer way to do that. Um, yeah, another thing is to use indicators uh, on the floor and uh, we all have spoken on, uh, already about that and LinkedIn everywhere. Uh, yeah, just a kind of a little reminder. So these measures will uh, help to create a safe environment, physically a safe environment in the office. And now we're going to uh, talk about communication and policies. So once, uh, once again, when we talk about returning to normal, normal is not going to be the same. And uh, it's time when people may have lost um, their ones or health or just sense of stability. Um, it's very important once again to have that space and time and be compassionate um, about others and in the, in the communication and when managing people. So employee voice and uh, regular surveys once again. I know one uh, Danish company who are actually uh, like and they have every week well-being surveys and they're just a basic five questions but that in, raises awareness quite a lot that well-being is not only about how you feel but how do you sleep at night uh, do you have disrupted sleep pattern or how do you eat these days and so on are you remaining physically active do you feel connected to your team do you feel connected to your people so um yeah employees will now require more sensitive and sensible um management and uh, I would say less directive. That's what we learn through coaching. And our coaching approach is the one which is um, quite helpful in these circumstances. When we um, create that space for people to talk about uh, their emotions uh, and through asking questions, they just open up and they kind of uh, see the solution. Um, start seeing the solutions and on the physiological level it helps us to switch from fight to fight reaction automatic reaction and being totally engaged into your emotions into a cognitive uh, state when you um, start thinking about it you start talking about it and then find uh, solutions learning and development events is another thing that uh, is helpful we could um, raise awareness of well-being through streamed talks, webinars, uh, learning activities and tools, uh, other tools are helpful. For example, mindfulness meditation, uh, which can be done in five minutes, or body awareness meditation is very helpful. Body scan, uh, it raises uh, your awareness of the body and your sensations. And when there is a reaction, a strong reaction to stress, for example, you're easy, uh, like you quicker recognize that and you learn how to deal with it. Uh, Okay, so hear a little bit about the the safety ambassadors. Who are those? How does that work? How did you get that rolling in your organization? Yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, we know about uh, up uh, to down communication when yeah, and this one is sharing this ownership. We're all in this uh, boat together and safety ambassadors and change managers, they are all those people who may feel that they cope better and they can actually create, help you create a support, supportive environment in the office and talk with their uh, colleagues and share their experiences, share the tools and instruments they found helpful. And also uh, they will be the ones who are receiving the communication from the organization, from the managers, and then uh, support that uh, knowledge and reinforce new behavior in the office. Okay, that's very helpful and very, uh it would seem like a, a, a part of a cohesive strategy that without, you know, ambassadors to fulfill it, then 
other folks become the tattletellers or the cops in the office. So exactly. and so isn't, you know, washing their hands or so-and-so isn't wearing a mask or. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, here uh, also is important. Like we've spoken about the policies and the absence and sickness policy. If it's too strict, that may cause more issues. So I think it's time for us at least to temporarily review those. Mm -hmm. uh, what we do in our company at the moment is that uh, people are just have their flexible working hours. Uh, the main thing, they do the minimum that is required at this stage for work. Um, they work on a, a, like consultancy, so recruitment consultancy. So they do their job and then they can be completely flexible about their time. Um, so, and in case they need to be absent because of their health or they're not feeling well, they won't be afraid um, to that there is a risk to lose their job, for example. Um, I've heard that from um, many HR peers is that a key element to this is the flexibility. That exactly, the, yeah. That the old policies of strict and no, these are your hours and you must produce X aren't going to work in this environment, at least temporarily. Yeah, flexibility and having this choice. And also there's still a significant others that may still be at home uh, or in high risk group. And uh, we want to know and communicate clearly how those people can continue uh, doing their responsibilities of care of others. And um, so, yeah, again, flexibility. So another point of communication is uh, communicating about COVID-19 and what's going on and what are these symptoms and what happens if you recognize those symptoms in yourself or the others. So we don't want people to hide um, that they have symptoms or something is wrong going on and uh, therefore we should be clear about how um, and where they can find the support and uh, what exactly they need to do in accordance with the government guidance and advice or World Health Association or any uh, reputed and um, um, source. Yeah, another point I would like to talk about is the to kind of help uh, educate line managers and people to be respectful, uh, respectful about talking uh, when talking about the virus. Um, a new study has analyzed uh, how people dealing with stress uh, respond to a variety of different messaging, offering emotional support. If we say, uh, don't take it so hard, or don't think about it, just, just move on with it. I, probably that's not related to somebody um, passing away, sorry. But yeah, it's, if some, someone is feeling over emotional, stressful, um, and don't think about it, or that's gonna be fine, it's not helpful. But creating that space for the person to be open about emotions and uh, feelings, that can help them actually to start searching for those uh, solutions and decisions and uh, that will help them navigate through. So uh, communication about company updates, plans, and uh, what's going on. So uh, my um, employees, they were very concerned in the first uh, weeks, what are we going to do? Where, whether people are going to be far load, yes, no, uh, will we stay uh, in the business and so on. And uh, what I found super uh, helpful and they shared with me as well when um, we, we are just being clear, as clear as possible uh, what's going on and what are the news in the organizations and what are our plans and risk management and what do we do, how do we seek uh, financial support if required uh, from other organizations or loans, etc. Or we just uh, yeah, like share clearly and transparently what's going on. And also, I believe, well, because I work uh, in a recruitment agency, in the future, people will be asking uh, new talent uh, and people that we hire in the future, they will ask uh, how, how your company dealt with it and how did you keep people safe and secure during the coronavirus pandemic. Yeah, we're going to the pretty much last part of my uh, talk. Are we okay with time?
can you say? Yes, I think we've got about 10 more minutes and, and I see you've got some really rich content to wrap it up. So I'm, I'm, this is great, thank you. Lovely, thank you very much. And the final point again is here to emphasize the link between the employee uh, well-being and performance and to understand again, what impacts performance at work. Commitment from the company, meaning um, like how we are connected to our people, how do we um, share that uh, experience and how do we support our people is quite important for their uh, performance. Um, emotional challenges, understanding your, your own emotions, understanding the emotions of other people. Um, that's very important as well. Psychological well-being, as I said before, physical health and remaining physically active are also influenced because physical health, as we've spoken about connection between physical body, emotional uh, state and the performance already. So once again, it's, it shows the link between physical health and psychological well-being as well. Leisure time recovery and quality breaks. Uh, have those times when you're off the screen and uh, be, uh, remind employees to have those breaks and launches off the desk um, and that will uh, help them recover during that leisure or just break time. Working environment and uh, equipment, relationship at work with colleagues, once again talking about sense of belonging and being one um, of the many in a good way uh, that also influence uh, performance at work. Opportunities for growth and other motivations that we normally talk uh, in other circumstances. They, uh, everything is here. Let's go to the next slide. What about performance outside of work? So recovery experiences outside of work uh, impact uh, performance. And when people uh, pick up a new skill, uh, a new hobby and learn a new skill that really generates those resources. One of the core theory uh, of stress in organizational psychology is con conservation uh, of resources theory. And that means that we have our work, for example, we have a relationship, family, we have our hobby, and so on and so on. And these are kind of uh, carriages that are interconnected between themselves. And if for one person, let's say only kind of 99% in work, that increases uh, risk of burnout. However, if a person has many, many other life activities and uh, those chapters in life that helps them to be more resilient, and uh, master, through master learning new skills, we kind of uh, refill that resource, psychological resource and personal resource related to um, new skills and learning and development just generally. Um, psychological detachment from work and is, uh, means being able to switch off your head and not to think about uh, work when you are not working. And uh, here meditation and uh, meditation particularly helps uh, to recognize, first of all, what you're thinking and uh, how you can redirect your thinking into something that uh, is happening in the present moment, uh, as well as physical exercise, but that's uh, the other obvious one. Um, sense of control around your off time. We have spoken about that one, but that's kind of to recap and summarize once again. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, here, quite a lot of things, but I would say just um, have a look and um, maybe you already have been using some of these uh, tips and um, approaches. So uh, learning and developing events on topics, how to support yourself through difficult times and creating dedicated space where people can talk, engage in physical, physical activities, probably buying new equipment in the office so people can stand and have a walk around the office and um, jump on a stepper or something safe uh, that can be used in the office is super helpful. Uh, let's, uh, the financial, yeah, we've spoken about financial well-being already, uh, that it's uh, actually influenced your psychological well-being. For example, um, like I've spoken one of the companies and what they came up with uh, is they invited a financial consultant uh, for a day and uh, everyone who wanted to have a 
question asked or they are worried about their personal finances, they could approach that person and have a chat and receive that one-to-one -one communication. And that helps uh, with managing anxiety and helps to plan and be aware of what are the other options. Yeah. Okay, um, so remain uh, connected with people and their wants, uh, mindfulness, mindfulness and meditation, burnout prevention, coaching is quite helpful. So here's just kind of to summarize, I will not talk again through all these points. Such a good checklist though. I mean, this yeah. is something that I think every, every HR person who's responsible for the well-being and, and ensuring yeah. um, a, a comprehensive plan for re-entry um, as well as ensuring the well-being, this is a checklist. This is, ha have you instituted some learning and development opportunities? Are you making sure that you're encouraging the physical activity? And then all the way down to preventing burnout. Exactly. You know, are you exactly. using external or internal coaches to address burnout? Because it's going to be more real now perhaps than ever. So this is mm -hmm. a, a well-written list that I think is very useful. Yeah. Another thing that I would like to also mention, uh, we, we should manage our expectations about people's performance, and, but also set deadlines, which deadlines and be clear about deadlines and the results and help people manage the workload. Uh, and if they have an issue, who they can approach and how they, what is the allowance there? What is flexibility there? What are the expect, expectations from the line managers? Uh, from uh, employees. And the last slide, the one which is like kind of my main message, that psychological well-being is the one of significant uh, predictors of performance. And that's why we should reinforce um, people to um, look after themselves, but also help them with that. It's great. Okay, um, so here we are, and um, yeah, we've a couple of um, freebies, bonuses that you know for our audience. Um, share a little bit about. Um, I see on the screen. This is how folks can get a hold of you. But will you also share why people reach out to you, and a little bit about your thirty-minute um, body mind practice trial? Yeah, so uh, we created recently with Diana, we were consulting just in the middle of the COVID-19 outbreak <laughs> because people started to approach us and like how to deal with their stress and what can we do so that, and actually we use like at RSI London in the company where I'm uh, leading the org development, we uh, started to use the same uh, services from my other company, which is uh, pretty cool because uh, what we do is a live streaming in, uh, mindfulness sessions where 30 people can join at the same time. It's 15 minutes uh, session, 15, 30, and up to 60. Mindfulness, meditation, and corporate yoga and to reinforce that physical activity, also to lower the stress level and increase their uh, body awareness and increase their kind of well being in general. So it's kind of on the spot solution. If you ha don't have all that, you don't have your strategy developed, how you can support your employee well-being, this is on the spot solution, basically. Yeah. Live streamed, yeah. just in your computer. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. And then, of course, you also do stress awareness training and you know, burnout prevention coaching, as well as building resilience workshops, financial well-being workshops, uh, and then this uh, on-the-spot well being solutions. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. 